welcome everybody. I'm uh, Jonathan Zeitlin. I'm uh, one of the uh, the co-conveners of this um, monthly online seminar from the ECPR Standing Group um, on the EU. My uh, uh, co-convener, Natalie Brock, hopefully will uh, join us a little bit um, later. We're delighted that we this is our our second meeting. We have um, Violeta Moreno Locks, who is um, a professor of law at Queen Mary University London, where she also directs the Center for the Legal Study of Borders uh, and Migration. She's going to talk to us about uh, the Christification of EU uh, migration uh, governance. Um, and then as discussant, we have um, uh, Nick Vaughan uh, Williams, who's professor of uh, international security at the University of Warwick, where he's also vice provost and chair of the Faculty of Social Sciences. The format is that um, uh, Violetta will talk for uh, 25 minutes, half an hour, then Nick will give his comments up to about 10 minutes. Um, I will offer also offer some uh, off the cuff uh, comments. Um, and then we'll open up to you, uh, the audience, and you can, um, at that point, uh, you can put on your, uh, your cameras and you'll be able to uh, speak in person. When I call on you, you can put up your hands uh, in, uh, you know, using the reaction function at the bottom of your screen. That's probably more effective than um, putting up your hand uh, physically in the window because we're about 23 people at the moment and I might not see you. So, uh, Violetta, the virtual floor is yours uh, and please start sharing your slides. Okay, so thank you, Jonathan and Natalie, when she joins us for inviting me and um, giving me the opportunity to present this work in progress to such a learned and multidisciplinary audience. Um, the paper focuses, I mean, as you can see in the title, on the effect that framing migration as crisis has on the operation of the law that regulates mobility and access to asylum in the EU. And what I have called the crisification of migration governance has probably its most immediate origins in the so-called uh, migration crisis of the Mediterranean of the summer of 2015 that you will be all familiar with. But with this term, I would intend to theorize and problematize what I think is a much wider and more persistent um, phenomenon, which is the framing of migration as crisis or um, as the potential and perennial threat of uncontrolled, unauthorized movements of third country nationals, whether that threat actually ever materializes, which to my mind serves to securitize migration as a risk that the European Union um, intends to detect, anticipate and preempt nearly at all costs. And so what I'm going to be discussing is about this link between crisis, risk and migration, which is at the heart of crisification as a system of um, governance. So, oops, uh, slides go here. OK, perfect. Um, crisis in, in EU migration governance, or rather the designation of certain events like the summer of 2015, as crisis is performative, very consequential, and has had key repercussions uh, for both how policy and law works within the European Union. Migration crises in the EU are discursively constructed, and I think maybe there is consensus around the table, the virtual table today, that this is so, regardless of their ontological basis. So there might be an ontological trigger, a reality outside the framing of something as a crisis, but that's not really essential. That's not what makes it become 
or be perceived as a crisis. If you think about the exodus of Ukrainian refugees um, to the European Union, we are now over 5 million uncounting of those that have gained temporary protection in European Union member states. And the crisis labeling about that displacement has been much less persistent than the barely 1 million refugees that reached um, the European Union shores in the summer of 2015. Um, so really, uh, crisis depends on EU leaders presenting events as crisis uh, to the public, a public that is perceptive to, to that um, labeling because it mobilizes fears and anxieties about security and stability. So once a migration event is designated as a crisis, um, what we can observe is a new mode of politics that emerges, that privileges speed, upbridges democratic processes and adopts exceptional measures to address the related urgency. And this has consequences not only for policymaking, but also affects how law works. Crisification deeply transforms the legal framework, and this is what um, I try to show in, in my paper that has also a written mm -hmm. version that for those interested, I would invite you to read. It's available on SSRN. And there are at least two mechanisms that are, I think, observable through which crisification occurs, occurs as a legal phenomenon softification on the one hand and lawification on the other. And I will explain these terms in a second. I know they sound maybe a bit pretentious or pompous, but there are reasons behind the choice of these words. And I have selected like, two examples, one for each, the EU Turkey statement of 2016 as an example of softification and the EU Belarus crisis of weaponization or instrumentalization of migration as an example of attempted lawification, to which we're going to, to turn um, in a second. So in, in a nutshell, um, what I had to say about crisification, and I'm heavily summarizing a big chunk of the paper here, so bear with me, uh, is that irregular migration has long been perceived and administered as a crisis, an emergency, or both in the EU basically as an abnormal event that needs to be managed, disciplined and controlled. And um, the EU mobilizes a number of mechanisms to do just that. Treating migration as crisis um, opens up a range of opportunities to experiment with new modes of governance that ultimately normalize the securitization of migration and legitimize the adoption of exceptional and by this, I um, want to say typically restrictive measures that um, derogate from uh, rights and related legal protections. So my main contention is that the presentation of migration as crisis has been utilized to justify extraordinary measures outside normal law and politics, which suspend the usual democratic processes of deliberation and contestation typical of the community method in favor of urgent mechanisms intended to quickly address and fix the situation, but which are generally inconsistent with human rights and, again, generally undermine international and EU legal standards. So the crisis narrative and particularly its conceptualization as an exception facilitates deterrence, coercion, and simply violence to become entrenched as structural, if not even necessary or essential features of, of the system. But crisification, it's not sporadic or accidental and typically has a life that goes beyond the, the, the crisis. I mean, the events that have been portrayed and treated as a crisis. To my mind, it has become a governance strategy in its own right that is actively chosen by EU actors as a mechanism to govern irregular migration. And the mechanisms through which crisification governs irregular migration in the legal sense and thereby transforms the legal landscape 
are again these two words, softification and, and loification, which are complementary. I'm sure there are variations between this spectrum of, I mean, marked by these two extremes. But what I think is readily observable is at least these two poles of traction in the continuum of uh, Christified law. So loification on the one hand, softification on the other. Softification is um, the process through which existing heart law protections are lowered or outright negated through the intermediation of informal soft law instruments. And on the other hand, we have lawification, which designates the process through which means and practices normally considered unacceptable, if not unlawful, enter the legal regime. And I use these terms rather than legalization because the rules adopted are hierarchically inferior to the constitutional norms that establish rights at the EU level. So although EU legislation is used to create an impression of legality, I mean, it's not that we are not utilizing legal means to achieve lawification, we are, but this legislation cannot formally subvert universal international law made standards uh, of legal protection, nor rules of EU primary law codified in treaties I mean, the Treaty on European Union and the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, as well as the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU. However, these new laws, this EU legislation that uh, constitutes an attempt at lawifying these measures, do change the game in practice. So it's not that they are neutral and have no effects, both in policy and law. And the two poles, the softification of existing hard law protections and the lawification of violations constitutes what, what I already mentioned, the extremes of a continuum that is probably richer and more complex than I'm able to convey um, in this oral presentation. And that is enabled, expanded and co-constituted by crisification as a mode of governance. So the law, in the crisification um, mechanisms of governance that it wants to problematize and discuss in the paper are, um, so the law is the subject and object of crisification. It is a means, but it's also an end in itself. And I have two concrete examples to illustrate uh, the situation. So one for each of these phenomenons. So, for softification, I have the EU Turkey statement that I think is well known to this audience, but just for the sake of completeness, I wanted to summarize the um, key features of this. We have EU action that in effect um, was instrumentalized to bypass the existing EU constitutional framework, diluting EU and international hard law protections. And the statement, although we typically refer to the March 2016 document, is actually the culmination of a longer process, all of which informal and mediated by soft law, constituted by a set of declarations, conclusions and an action plan, whereby the EU obtained from Turkey a pledge to readmit all irregular migrants, including refugees, and to prevent irregular flows across the agency, across the Eastern Mediterranean route towards the European Union. In return, Turkey was promised um, visa liberalization, the reactivation of the EU accession negotiations, and was transferred six, million, uh, 6 billion euros to cater for those contained within Turkey or forcibly returned to Turkey as a result of the implementation of the statement. And what refugees got from their part was, and has ever since been, violence and a negation of their rights. And why is this? Because the statement is based on an unfunded presumption of safety that ignores the human rights record of Turkey as documented not least by the very European Commission itself, 
uh, inter alia in progress reports regarding the accession process, but also by a host of other organizations and, and NGOs. The statement also disregards the situation on the ground and the fact that Turkey is the biggest refugee receiving country in the world, hosting 4 million refugees in very precarious conditions. And all of, uh, all of this while maintaining a geographical limitation to the 1951 Refugee Convention, according to which Turkey has not contracted an obligation to recognize as refugees people who do not come from a European uh, country. So by this reservation, Syrians, as well as other refugee populations coming from other parts of the world are not legally recognized by Turkey as refugees, simply because Turkey has refused to assume that um, obligation under international law, which is within its um, remit to, to not agree to. Nonetheless, as I said, Turkey has um, been hosting refugees under its national uh, laws and its domestic constitution, and so far hosts 4 million refugees, which is the top refugee population that any country worldwide is currently taking care of. And this includes 90% of Syrian refugees, along with Jordan and Lebanon. Uh, which actually, if you compare to European Union efforts, is, is quite um, shameful for, for the EU, which is hosting currently less than 2% of that cohort. What the statement also ignores is that forced migration flows of Syrian refugees and others cannot be stopped without violence, especially if the root causes driving people to flee in the first place persist. And in this particular case, the war in Syria it's still raging on. So basically, there is no way you can stop desperate populations which are forcibly being displaced to not um, try to gain safety in other countries. Therefore, at the heart of the statement, seeks a tacit acceptance that human rights violations may occur as part of the implementation of the agreement, including of the principle of non refoulement and the right to asylum, which are explicitly codified in EU primary law, in particular articles 18 and 19 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So, as a result, the statement softifies the existing legal framework by relying on a soft law, unenforceable instrument, which although claiming compliance with EU and international standards foresees no legal mechanisms uh, or policy or political mechanisms of democratic or judicial oversight, offering no concrete guarantees and no remedies in case of violations. And while it supposedly introduces an extraordinary and temporary measure, and I'm quoting verbatim from the statement, the statement system has become entrenched as an essential component of the EU's approach to external migration policy. The statement now offers a model, and again, I'm quoting from European Commission declarations, um, a model that, that the Commission has replicated with other third countries, including Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and other refugee producing countries. So the statement methods have now become completely normalized uh, and have become an essential part of the EU governance structures in relation to irregular migration and refugee management uh, in, in this field. If we now turn to the other example, the example of um, the EU Belarus crisis as an illustration of the law ification phenomenon, just as a background, the Belarus crisis began as you will probably know, in the aftermath of the Taliban takeover uh, during the summer of 2021, and should be understood against the background of Lukashenko's animosity vis-a-vis -vis the European Union for the sanctions that the EU imposed on the Lukashenko regime. And although EU authorities have spoken about a hybrid war or a hybrid attack by Lukashenko consisting in the luring of vulnerable populations, including particularly 
refugees, mostly from Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, to fly to Belarus visa free, on promises that they would then be helped to access asylum in Europe. Although we've been, I mean, the European authorities have been speaking about a hybrid war or a hybrid attack consisting of attracting refugees to Belarus on promises that they would then be helped to access asylum in Europe. The numbers um, of which we are speaking are relatively small. The most generous estimates um, count about 15,000, but that's actually very generous. Official commission numbers are lower, but in any event, that gives you an idea that numbers are not essential in the constitution of events being portrayed as a, as a crisis and the treatment of them as a crisis. And the rhetoric, as well as the measures that have been adopted to face this crisis have been highly dehumanizing. The response have actually been twofold. On the one hand, we have the governments of Poland, Latvia and Lithuania adopting emergency measures in violation of their human rights obligations, both under EU and international law, pushing asylum seekers away from their territories, employing anti-riot equipment and tactics to repel them, building a fence in the case of Poland, deploying the military, declaring a state of exception that has contributed to border deaths, including of children. And there is a lot of um, evidence that has been collected since June, July 2021 in this regard, not least by UN as well as EU bodies and the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights, as le at least on two occasions, has called on the three countries as well as the European Union to change uh, tack. This to no avail because um, the other side of the reaction has been on the part of the European Union, which rather than condemning uh, the approach by these three countries, it has instead supported them through funding, operational assistance delivered by Frontex, uh, the asylum agency, as well as Europol, and so-called diplomatic efforts, migration diplomacy efforts, engaging the countries of origin of the migrants' concerns to convince them to take them back and to convince them to impede further exits from their territories, both of which actions are constitutive of violations of the right to leave any country, including one's own, as well as the right to asylum and protection against refoulement. What is most worrisome is that the Commission has now tabled several legislative proposals that would loify these practices, which am at uh, jointly amount to an attempt at legalizing pushbacks, right? So the proposals are these four instruments that you see on the screen. They're proposals for EU legislation, for regulations, including an amendment to the Schengen Borders Code, the basic instrument that regulates um, cross uh, boarding, uh, so cr border crossing across the external border of the European Union. Um, and the proposals have uh, jointly been justified as an attempt at addressing the exceptional circumstance of instrumentalization of migrants to avoid that they become weaponized by third countries that use them in the hope of gaining a political advantage vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. So the crisis narrative, and in this case, in the form of um, a bellicose uh, set of um, terms like um, yeah, weapons or um, war and hybrid attacks and so on, has been very productive leading to a situation that if the four instruments were adopted, they would introduce not really exceptional measures, but a permanent framework that would um, equip the European Union to respond to future similar situations. So though the starting point is the introduction of measures intended as temporary, exceptional and emergency based, the end result is that they would be normalized as part of the EU at key, 
normalized also in the sense that these measures create an impression of legality and they would constitute part and parcel of the permanent framework of the Schengen regime that would allow um, the European Union and the member states to respond to similar situations in the future. They will introduce a very problematic emergency migration and asylum management procedure with virtually no procedural and no, or no material guarantees to preserve access to asylum and the principle of non refoulement. So this is why these measures are so um, problematic. And I'm slowly coming to my conclusion. Um, the two examples, so the eu turkey statement on the one hand and the Belarus instrumentalization migration package on the other, demonstrate how crisisification is not an accident, but a governance strategy that is increasingly gaining traction as the dominant approach that the European Union is proactively adopting towards irregular migration. And the crisis security migration connection that is at the heart of this strategy allows for a permanent state of exception that is selective and targets specifically irregular migrants, including refugees. Crisification in this context serves to mobilize the resources of the state of exception, the Schmittian state of exception, as, as theorized by, by Schmidt and Agamben and others, but it does so in a focused way that validates and perpetuates exceptionalism, embedding rightlessness from within, but not in general terms regarding the whole of the population. You would see, for example, in the reaction to the COVID pandemic in several member states, as well as EU-wide, it does this only vis-a-vis -vis irregular migrants. And it does this in um, the absence of specific checks and balances that become neutralized, uh, making crisification very problematic, not only policy-wise, and uh, uh, policy wise, but also legally, an anathema to the rule of law principle that supposedly governs the entire EU legal order, and in particular, the legal regime attached to the community method that one would expect to see in the migration field. If you remember, migration, asylum and borders were policy areas transferred to the first pillar, when we still have pillars, in the Treaty of Amsterdam. So there's no reason why we should see a preeminence of raw executive power or a re-intergovernmentalization in this domain. We are talking about a first pillar community method um, policy field that is um, so that's it, subrestitiously, I cannot pronounce it, being transformed um, without formal treaty amendment in ways that really go beyond what um, primary treaty rules would allow member states or the European institutions to, to do. With this, I conclude. I thank you very much for your attention. As I mentioned, this is work in progress. The written version of the working paper is available on SSRN. I thank you very much for your attention and look forward for uh, to the discussion and your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Violeta. So we'll proceed directly now to the uh, the discussion, Nick uh, Vaughan Williams. So um, ah, I see Natalie, our co convener, has uh, has arrived. Welcome, Natalie. Um, and so, Nick, go ahead. Uh, you have up to ten minutes for your comments. Okay, great. Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, greetings from Coventry uh, here in the UK. Um, thanks so much to Jonathan and to Natalie for, uh, for this invitation to, to discuss Violetta's paper, which I have to say is a really excellent read and will, I'm sure, become an extremely important contribution to the interdisciplinary literature. I, I really do urge everyone to um, after this um, discussion, read read the paper. Um, I was delighted to accept the invitation uh, because my own recent work um, uh, 
has analysed the social, political and cultural uh, production of crisis narratives to frame population displacement and governmental responses in Europe. And, and that led to two books. Um, the first, uh, Vernacular Border Security, Citizens' Narratives of uh, Europe's Migration Crisis, um, and also Reclaiming Migration, which was co-authored with um, colleagues here at Warwick, uh, Vicky Squire, Dalal Stevens, and uh, Nina Pukowski. Um, I think it's fair to say that both Violetta and I share a number of common uh, starting points in, in our analyses. We're both interested in the performative effects that crisis narratives have on the social realities of migratory dynamics that they claim merely to describe. And, and of course, as um, Violetta's paper draws out, once invoked, crisis narratives uh, take a given issue, in, in this case, uh, human mobility, and relocate the issue outside of the normal realm of law and politics with reference to emergency conditions. And in turn, of course, this, this process, um, which Violetta terms crisisification, justifies um, a range of deterrent border security measures um, that would otherwise be unpalatable, I, I agree, to, to liberal democratic societies, su such as the criminalization of NGO practices, militarized interventions against people seeking asylum, hotspots, pushbacks, the, the full range of, of war building that, that Violetta um, discusses so admirably in her paper. Now, of course, I think by now all of this is quite well established in, in the literatures that we're familiar with and, and beyond. Um, but um, I think Violetta, it's fair to say, goes further than those extant uh, analyses to show how crisisification in the context of migration and border security has transformed the legal order. And I think it's that process of transformation um, which she documents and charts so clearly uh, in, in the paper. Her analysis of the softification of existing legal obligations and, and what she terms the lawification of violations I think you know those two moves add a really important new layer of understanding um, uh, of crisisification as uh, a particular logic of the state of exception, and, and I really think that those um, conceptual and methodological tools will be picked up and used widely. They they certainly deserve to be. Um, I suppose in responding to the paper. Um, as I suggested at the beginning, I'd like to take a few steps back, if I may, and, and focus my commentary around this central concept of crucifixion, and to consider where ultimately this leaves Violetta, and indeed any of us um, struggling with legal and political analysis of the normalisation of deterrent border security in the contemporary EU context. And I suppose I've got four main interrelated areas um, to, to open up this discussion. The first concerns the political ambiguity, if you like, of the crisis narrative. Crisification, of course, hasn't only been mobilised by, let's say, elite governmental actors to justify a securitised response to increased ar arrivals uh, and deaths in Europe. As we know, it's also been mobilised tactically, proactively, um, some might say successfully in some in some contexts by a range of, a range of NGOs, including Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, Médecins Sans Frontières, precisely as a political strategy to draw public attention to increased deaths at sea and to critique inadequate um, international legal protection for those on the move, and also to make humanitarian demands on their behalf. Now, we may simply see this in the framework, in the, in the conceptual framework of Violetta's paper as evidence of this um, coupling of humanitarian and securitization logics. But I wonder if there is value or scope in exploring how crucifixion has that politically and uh, ethically ambivalent status that means that it can be mobilized by a range of actors in support of, of different 
or ostensibly different political uh, um, objectives. Second, I, I think one of the problems of the dominant crisis narrative, however it is used, is that it, it tends to conflate a series of geographically and historically situated events, responses and experiences as if they were all part of a single event whether that's the 2015 so-called migration crisis or or indeed the the 2021 belarus crisis and this tends to produce uh decontextualized subjects of crisis particularly of migration crises who are positioned as being outside of history and politics, which leads to a focus on how um, governments, governmental actors may manage their biological uh, immediate needs rather than uh, recognizing their legal rights and political claims. So I suppose my, my question here would be, what are, what are the dangers? What are the pitfalls? What are the risks? Um, as social scientists, in us reproducing this dominant crisis narrative um, in our analyses and in perpetuating this logic of, of crisification with all of the attendant uh, exclusions and violences, Violetta, that you, that you draw out in, in the paper. And I suppose my third and fourth points are going to expand on, on that, on that um, consideration in different ways. Uh, the, the third point would be that the crisis narrative in the context of European migration and asylum policy implies that the crisis is somehow exogenous to Europe, that it is a crisis faced by European societies, in inverted commas, from the outside, rather than, to work with your argument, one that is performatively produced by different actors in those societies. And so, you know, as a lot of the post-colonial literature has, has drawn out, this inevitably reproduces a certain uh, Eurocentric imaginary of, of the crisis, which you touch upon in the paper, but I feel could be, could be developed uh, and usefully discussed in response to your analysis. People like Nicholas de Geneva, among others, have highlighted the racialized nature of the uh, 2015 migration crisis uh, narrative in particular. Um, Guminda Bambra argues that the exteriorization of the crisis is a continuation of Europe's you know, self-enclosing narrative of European integration as a peaceful project, as distinct from um, uh, European countries' reliance on you know, forced exploitation of land um, labor and markets overseas, particularly, of course, in, in the African uh, continent. So what are the implications of that post-colonial critique for our engagement with the politics of crisification? To what extent can or do we think that, uh, to what extent can or do we think, can we think outside of the crisis frame? And how can we avoid this logic of innocence? And what's at stake in trying to move beyond it? What critical resources exist for decoupling migration and crisis as social phenomena? And finally, um, according to um, Roitman, um, uh, every crisis narrative, quote, generates meaning in a self-referential system. And so she advocates, as, as I'm sure you're aware, um, for, an for analysts to adopt an actively anti-crisis perspective and seek out non-crisis narratives as the starting point for analysis and critique. And of course, she's, she's not working in the context of, of European migration um, and asylum policy, but um, as part of a team at Warwick uh, led by Vicky Squire, I undertook um, interviews with people on the move in 2015 in Malta, Sicily and Kos, and then uh, a year later in Berlin, Istanbul, Athens and Rome. And we found from those 280 or so in-depth interviews that people on the move rarely described themselves as being part of a migration crisis. We encountered a range of alternative um, starting points and intersecting drivers of flight. Whereas dominant crisis narratives 
as you draw out, tend to focus on rupture or change. The testimonies of people on the move um, highlighted uh, continuity. Um, with some asylum seekers with temporary protection status in Malta having been caught in that limbo status for, for more than a decade. So those testimonies highlight that events portrayed in the European context as exceptional um, are typically experienced by those seeking asylum as a feature of, of everyday life and of ongoing historical relations with, with Europe. So how can analyses of crisification avoid the silencing of those perspectives and experiences? Is crisification a never ending cycle with no route out? At some parts in your paper, I get the impression that it might be, but in others, I think there are openings and there are opportunities for thinking beyond this, this logic. Um, so what alternative non or anti-crisis starting points can we discern? What, if any, are the opportunities for de-crisification? There's plenty more that I could say in response to this excellent um, piece of research, but I, I, I will simply conclude my part of today's discussion by congratulating Violetta on what I think is a masterful analysis, um, which I've enjoyed reading and engaging with, and which I think prompts a number of, of very challenging, bigger, bigger picture questions for us all to consider. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nick. So before I um, turn the, uh, the floor back to Violetta and let her respond to, uh, to Nick's comments, I'd like to offer uh, a couple of comments of my own. And uh, starting from the, uh, the perspective that, um, you know, I'm not a migration specialist, but rather somebody who works more broadly uh, on uh, uh, the gov governance and policy making in the EU, and so there are really two points I want to pick up on, and they're they're connected to the central themes of um, Violetta's talk. So one is about crisis or crisification, and the other is about law. So, um, I mean, Violetta, you you and the, the paper begins with a kind of broader framing of crisis and emergency state of exception, uh, strengthening of executive uh, power and authority and weakening of law in the, uh, in the EU. And the question is whether, um, I mean, leaving open the, the, the issue whether that picture fits well the, um, the migration case, and you, you give us some very clear examples and uh, tool analytical tools for looking at that, whether how well it fits crisis and governance in the EU uh, more generally. And I know shortage of people who have talked about things like uh, emergency power Europe or authoritarian liberalism uh, in the EU and have used um, you know these older uh, frames like that, that of Carl Schmidt and his uh, antagonists um, from the 1920s and 30s uh, to frame it, but um, I would I would ask: Is that really what we have seen in the EU over the the past uh, 15 years? So um, I would say that to the extent there were emergency measures taken in the Euro crisis, uh, those have been in many respects rolled back, revised, uh, normalized. We don't see. We don't have a troika. We don't, um, uh, you know, even institutions created during the uh, the euro crisis, like the European Stability Mechanism, uh, have not been used um, in the response uh, to the the pandemic. And so that brings me to the the second point about crisis, which is if we think about, um, you know, the literature about. Uh, uh, poly crisis in the uh, the EU. Um, I mean, certainly people are arguing. I think I would argue myself um, that uh, linking back to a longer uh, tradition of thinking about uh, European integration, that crises can be a moment uh, for calling into question blockages 
uh, in policy making and the um, uh, the reinterpretation of the uh, the treaties and the new initiatives, particularly uh, for uh, recovery and resilience in the pandemic, would fit there. But people would might say the same about um, the EU's uh, security, collective security and defense uh, role in response to the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. So, um, you know, does that really fit with the narrative, the the the, the view of crisisification? that you're putting forward? Is there something possibly distinctive about migration and asylum, which of all the elements of the polycrisis, the original polycrisis of, let's say, 1915, sorry, 2015, 2016, uh, is the most unresolved? So, uh, you know, okay, how should we think about uh, migration, asylum, and crisis together? And the second is about how to think about um, uh, law and here, there's something that you didn't talk about in the paper, but you did talk about at the very end of your presentation, which is um, the uh, the issue of migration and asylum as fields which, um, due to changes in the treaties, have become subject to the community method or the ordinary uh, legislative. Uh, procedure and and you're implicitly saying, well, why aren't we using them? Why are we engaging in this, um, you know, softification or at least softening of legal uh, protections? And here, I think there is something kind of missing in the paper, and that is a reflection on the uh, the first reaction of the EU and especially the European Commission to the. Um, refugee crisis of 2015, which was precisely an attempt to use the new powers uh, to take binding decisions by qualified majority about the reallocation of refugees. And what is interesting there, uh, and I mean tragic obviously, is that uh, that was proved to be a complete failure. Um, it did not prove possible whatever the legal powers of the uh, the Commission and the Council uh, reaffirmed subsequently by the Court of Justice uh, to make that uh, approach to refugees um, stick. And the result has been that there has been a de facto uh, return to unanimous decision making in the European Council rather than uh, decisions by qualified majority in the um, uh, Justice and Home Affairs um, formation of the Council for dealing with uh, with questions of, let's say, surges of migrants and refugees. And so I think you have to ask yourself the question of um, when we talk about softening and hardening of law, what are the social and political conditions for being able to use legal tools when they are present? Um, so also, what is the the alternative to the the um, you know uh, strategies which have been adopted since while you know in terms of legal obligations, we can say, you know maintaining the rights of asylum seekers and non refoulement is a solemn commitment of the EU. The EU does not in practice seem to be able politically to uh, implement those commitments and hence the search which we may deplore for these kinds of uh, of alternatives, whether they be in terms of soft law or hard, hard uh, regulations that may violate those international uh, commitments. So that's maybe a little long-winded, but I, I think it might be useful to have you re reflect on. And then we can open up uh, to the audience, uh, including um, Natalie, if you have anything you want to to uh, interject into the discussion. So, um, Violetta, I give you back the floor. Thank you. Thank you both for these very rich and uh, conscientious comments. Um, I've been frantically taking notes, but uh, again, if you do have them in written form, that would be super helpful. So I'll 
thank you in advance if you can um, send them on by email. Uh, I, I basically, yeah, agree with um, all the comments. I, I will have some quick reactions. I mean, I don't know if all of this can be done in one single paper, but uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is the field that I've been interested in for quite a while. And I, I mean, alongside this paper, there are two more, one forthcoming on informal treaties. So the story after the EU-Turkey deal and um, its prolongation with other third countries, which is um, coming up as a first as a working paper in um, of the EUI law series, uh, which I hope it's going to be up uh, in the next couple of days. And another one precisely on the suspension of the Dublin regime that Jonathan was speaking about, the implosion of that regime and its transformation into these measures of relocation, hotspots, and the new uh, asylum package um, reform of reforms that is attached to the new Pact on Asylum and Migration that is currently under negotiation. And that's going to come up as an open access article on European papers again, hopefully soon. It's already been su submitted. So, but so basically, all of this uh, will, I mean, give me food for thought for further work and also for the revision of this current paper. Uh, I do think that um, the production of crisis narratives, particularly regarding migration and asylum events and how. Um, they perform all of these effects that uh, you've picked up, Nick, in your different outputs um, on your own and with other colleagues. Uh, and I think what, what, what picked my attention um, in relation to that literature, including yours, is that once invoked, um, crisis narratives and crisis methods are hardly ever undone. Um, and and emergency conditions mm, tend to per permanentalize, if that's a word, take hold and become normalized. But I mean, in legal terms, normalized quite literally. I mean, they become the new norm, right? They displace the current norm and they are no longer seen as the exception. They, they truly displace and replace what used to be the norm. Um, and they transform our reference um, points that, that we might um, have had prior. So the level of tolerability of legal transgressions and, and also policy transgressions and political transgressions becomes expanded, right? And, and I speak about these softification and, and lawification processes as the vehicles through which these happens. But so in relation to migration, I mean, obviously crisis has been used in other realms um, to speak about the euro crisis or the COVID pandemic um, governance. And I think crisification in those domains would behave a bit differently. So uh, speaking to Jonathan and, and his work on polycrisis, permacrisis and so on, in the field of, in the field of migration, I think there is uh, a cost substantial imbrication between crisification and securitization. So crisification for me is the institutional the institutional phase of securitization. So once you are sure you want to treat something as a threat, something that you want to negativize and repel, expel from your system, that becomes um, securitized and, and, and that discursive toolbox can consolidate in a machinery of, of crisification, right? So I think the two are quite related. And it's true that probably these terms are ethically ambivalent, as Nick was um, talking about, like NGOs have also jumped on the train of crisification for different purposes. They wanted to co-opt the terminology for um, an elevated, more positive purpose, that of uh, Human, uh, human humanizing the field and 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 reintroduce human rights and and humanitarianism into the the discussion. I don't think they've succeeded, uh, and probably something similar can be observed 
in the discussion in the discussion of, uh, around security. I mean, I remember back in the nineties and the early two thousands, human security was a, a fancy thing to speak about, but it didn't really stick. I mean, I think if political elites are steering you know, populism, and if there is a political consensus, and I think this is quite established in the field of migration, there isn't really political parties to the left or the center or elsewhere, there isn't really an opposition to these discourses and narratives. And that's why the normalization has become so consolidated that we ever hardly speak about these legal transformations that I wanted to to map in, in, in my paper, because they, they've become so natural that you know human rights are for citizens and migrants might get some of them but not all of them and the ones that they get are so limited that they're exceptional and we're quite happy with that so our notions about state sovereignty and security and national control about territory and population are so ingrained that it's quite um routine to not speak about these things. Uh, about your point on the decontextualization and of, of migrants when we speak about crisis, Nick, and, and the fact that they become sort of taking outside history and politics, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the norms that we see constituted in times of crisis they become normalized because of this decontextualization. Once you imagine migration as a crisis, once you imagine migrants as subjects that are suspended in time and space and do not really have like a corporeal reality that you need to take into consideration, if you eliminate their histories and you eliminate their stories and you eliminate their agency, then you can end up with this violence-inspired mechanisms that can easily become law. And there is a danger that we reproduce these same violence in our ways of analyzing and speaking about these realities. I'm well aware of that. And, and, and I think the idea about looking into the post-colonial literature to perhaps continue theorizing and problematizing this phenomenon is a good one. Certainly, um, I was trying to avoid the logics of innocence in relation to the European Union. I mean, the Schengen regime is set in a way that it creates the conditions for what then we call a crisis to occur and reoccur throughout time. And that's great because it means that then Schengen authorities have always a task to fulfill and there is always a reason to continue the crisisification train because the crisis is constant, it's permanent. But what it's never told is the whole story about how that permanent nature was constructed and reached through decisions that were taken prior to um, the events that we call crisis. I mean, with the Dublin regime, for example, that becomes quite clear. If Dublin was actually a solidarity uh, and responsibility, fair responsibility distribution mechanism among member states participating in the regime, we would not have this concentration effect to the frontline member states that then lead to the crisis of the regime that leads to the suspension of the Dublin norms and um, the need for relocation, hotspots, and all the reforms that are currently being discussed. Uh, in terms of how to adopt an anti-crisis narrative that replaces the current account and these courses and the rhetoric that is predominant in this field. Um, I think feminist theory has something to offer. I recently read a piece by Diane Otto on something completely different, but I think she speaks about uncrisis thinking being necessary to avoid, I mean, to break the cycle of self-referential systems that generate the need for certain ways of thinking and responding to events that you call crisis and then you can never stop calling like that I mean calling them like that because that's um necessary to justify the measures that you adopted and that you're about to perpetuate and perfect no, so I think I can leave we, it at that 
Should we see if there's anyone in the audience who sure. has a question? Otherwise, um, you know, it would be fine for you to, to continue. So um, is there anyone who would like to comment uh, or ask a question? I do not see any hands popping up in the um, uh, in the virtual chat. So maybe I did not need to uh, to cut you off. Um, so if there isn't anybody else um, and there's more you want to say, then uh, then go ahead uh, if you like to, and then maybe I give it back to to Nick if he wants to come back in. Um, I mean, I wanted just to maybe um, pick on your point about um, the the lack of instruments that we have seen in other crises, like um, you know the deployment of the troika or the stability mechanism for the euro and 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 things like that that were very um, um, easy to identify as crisis instruments taking. EU law outside of the community method and subverting the usual mechanisms of policy making in a field that was supposed to be working in very specific ways and stopped working in those ways because of the invocation of crisis at a moment that probably ontologically and in real terms was actually constitutive of a crisis too. Um, and, and, and I think this might be due to the fact of um, the link between migration, security, and crisis that I was speaking about before, and the fact that there is a political consensus across the political spectrum that the securitization of migration is something that animates law and policy in this field. And there's not been a moment where this has not been so. So before the European Union gained competences with the Treaty of Amsterdam, uh, in the first pillar to regulate migration. Before that, migration was already tied up with counterterrorism, uh, cross-border crime, um, and all sorts of criminal law associations throughout the 80s and even back in the 70s when, say, the Trevi group was meeting. So there's never been really a point in the history of European integration, where asylum and migration have not been treated as a threat. Um, and I think that is the original sin that allows for a constant crisification that it's nurtured by moments of high peak, very eventful crisis moments, emergency moments that reinforce the crisification narrative and, and um, politics and lawmaking that we see happening today. And this point about um, the abandonment of the community method, I think requires more um, space than I, I've been allowed to, to grant in, in, in the paper that you have read. And um, maybe we could actually, I mean, somebody can pick that up, including myself, to, write the history of um, the undoing of the community method in this specific field. Because I think it really begins before Amsterdam, communitarization wasn't really wholeheartedly achieved when the Treaty of Amsterdam was adopted. If you remember, there was a transitional period of up to five years where the building blocks of migration, asylum and, and, and borders policy was to be um, codified, harmonized by unanimity in, 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 in the council with the parliament only being consulted. So the community method applied to this policy field has never really been that serious uh, and, and I understand the, polit the political reasons behind this, but then legally speaking and constitutionally speaking, once the transitional period was over, we should have incorporated community method thinking and methods in the way in which 
um, the policy field was being governed. And this hasn't really happened. Every time that we have had to reach reforms and, 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 and agreements in this field, we've seen um, quite a lot of disparities and 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 rifts about different um member states think of Orban the Visegrad countries not really ever agreeing to human rights friendly reforms of of the asylum and migration at key uh, uh and think about the European Commission never really starting infringement proceedings for uh violations of of the relevant norms particularly you know the pushbacks that we have seen in these three member states when speaking about the Belarus crisis and I'll stop here. I don't know. I mean, if anyone would have questions or comments or observations, I would very gladly take them on board. Nick, is there something you want to come in with at this stage? Well, I mean, I, I really welcome this this dialogue, and I think Violetta um, Violetta's responses there illustrate. Um, well, firstly, the depth of her thinking on on this subject, but but secondly, the ramifications of her argument across a number of of domains and literatures. I, I think her point there about the link between crisisification and securitization is is one that's very important. Um, it's one that I've been thinking about too, um, and of course, you know the. The logic of securitization shares that Schmittian logic, um, and so there is a common route that explains why you you might end up in a similar place if you if you follow both of those um, ways of thinking about how uh, human mobility has been framed in, in in a particular way in the EU context. I suppose um, I suppose I'd like to think that there has been opposition to these um, phenomena and that there are actually existing alternatives to the kind of um, transformations, both legal and political, um, that we've been discussing. But I suppose my suspicion is that they're given rather less prominence, both in media debates, in political um debates but also in academic work and that's why um i suppose i've been motivated along along with others to think about what alternative starting points might exist otherwise you know as wendy brown argues in 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 her book um world states waning sovereignty there is this tautology whereby um you know bunkered societies become ever more bunkered and through a failure of these logics of security, um, people feel are made to feel more and more insecure, um, and we're rather boxed into a corner. Um, now, it's really important that we don't enter the realm of, of wishful thinking and 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 so on. But there are there are debates out there that I think should be had about the extent to which, you know, the, the, the way in which the way in which methodologies to capture public opinion on these matters are themselves securitized and subject to these crisified logics mean that we have to work really hard in order to think creatively about alternative evidence bases to recover those alter the possibility of those alter alternative starting points otherwise i think we we enter into this realm of a self-perpetuating logic where um we might as well frankly pack up and and go home so i i, I continue the search to pierce that sort of bubble um and i think um it's a huge challenge methodologically um as well as politically um, but I think part of the uh, challenge is to better refine our analytical tools to understand how crucifixion works. And, and that's that's where I see huge value in Violetta's paper. Well, I think this is a perfect uh, moment to wrap up since I think a, a number of our uh, members of our audience have had to leave and are sending uh, warm and enthusiastic uh, 
comments on the paper and, and the discussion. So let me thank uh, Violetta and Nick, and also remind those who are left in the audience that we'll meet again on the 21st of November when uh, Lise Hermann, uh, Julian Herner, and Joseph Lacey will give a presentation on debating democratic backsliding in the European Parliament, a discourse analytical approach. I think, um, Natalie, cor correct me if I'm wrong, I think that um, the chair of our steering committee, Natasha Wunsch, is going to be the, uh, the discussant. So hope to see some of you there and um, I enjoy your evening.